He can't put tomato tape for tying tomato vines to steaks in those pockets, <laughs> along with a thick roll of garden jute, car keys, and a phone. He can't put pruning clippers in the other pocket with perhaps a notepad to capture an almost forgotten memory of post-apocalyptic and sarcastic saber-toothed tiger with the telepathic voice of British actor Sean Bean. He admitted that there was a psychic cost to not always just telling the truth and fondly referenced the Key and Peel skits about Luther, his anger translator. Mm. But he didn't worry over whether he'd been wrong to bite his tongue. One thing that occurred to me as we were talking is that Obama's view of his own political situation echoes the current reality of the Democratic Party. Barack Hussein Obama, a black man running for office during the era of the war on terror, understood the deck was stacked against him. I mean, like, so badly stacked against him again that he easily won election yeah. against John McCain, yeah. like the whitest, oldest, grandest Republican who of ran, all time. And then Mitt with, Romney. Like, with, who ran, and, and McCain and Palin ran a, a race campaign. Like, they tried to use that as a, as a wedge. It didn't work because the fucking economy was collapsing and he was promising to do something about it. And then he fucking didn't. If he was going to win... He would need the support of people inclined to view him with suspicion. He would need not just to speak to their hopes, but to defuse their fears. To hear Obama tell it, those fears were not just that too much change would come too fast, but that those who fought that change or worried over it would be judged or cast out. People knew I was left on issues like race or gender equality and LB LGBTQ issues. I mean, like, wasn't he against gay marriage? He was, in fact, yes. Yeah, no, he, say, he said it was like this, oh, I think the state should decide. I mean, uh, like, they should decide uh, what a man and uh, another man uh, want to do uh, in a limousine <laughs> together. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think the reason I was successful campaigning in downstate Illinois or Iowa or places like that is they never felt as if I was condemning them for not having gotten to the politically correct answer quick enough or that they were morally suspect because they had grown up with and believed in more traditional values. Democrats, too, face an unforgiving context. Their coalition leads young, urban, and diverse, while America's turnout patterns and electoral geography favor the old, rural, and white. According to 538, a Republicans hold a 3.5-point advantage in the Electoral College, a 5-point advantage in the Senate, and a 2-point advantage in the House, even after winning many more votes than Republicans in 2018 and 2020. Democrats are at a 50-50 split in the Senate and have a bare four-seat majority in the House. Odds are they will lose the House and possibly the Senate in 2022. This is the fundamental as asymmetry of American politics right now. To hold power, Democrats need to win voters who are right of center. Republicans do not win to need to win votes who are left of center. Even worse, Republicans control the election laws and redistricting processes in 23 states, while Democrats control 15. Uh, just going on here, it's because most Democrats I know are panicked over the convergence of their geographic disadvantage and the, and the Republican assault on democracy. In my view, they're right to be. The situation is dire, and if the Republican Party could reorient itself around more competent candidates, it could become catastrophic. Obama has argued that Senate Democrats should abolish the filibuster and pass the legislation necessary to protect American democracy. I wish they'd listened to him on that, but as of now, the Democrats' democracy agenda is imperiled, and so, and so are they. I mean... You said, like, Obama made the phone call to end the Democratic primary. Like, you're telling me he can't make a phone call to Joe Manchin or Kristen Sinema? I mean, I understand, like, the, the pressure points are a little bit different there. But, like, it just seems to me like... Well, the thing is, it's not Kristen Sinema and Joe Manchin. They are there to take the heat for the fucking 15 other Democrats who wouldn't want like, to like vote Chris for Coons. those things either. And now yeah. they don't have to say Chuck anything. Chuck Schumer. That's, it's like the idea that it's just these two because they're the ones who publicly say it. It's like, really, the rest of the Democratic Senate fucking caucus all of whom got there by eating baby brains in back rooms are just champing at the bit to do this shit. And it's these two gomers who are stopping them from doing it. No, I've they're the two who can be public about it with the least amount of backlash because Manchin thinks, hey, I'm from West Virginia. None of this matters anyway. There's no, no way a Demo I can be pressured by Democrats. And fucking Kristen Stewart, or Kristen Stewart, Kristen Cinema. <laughs> Uh, she wants to fucking like host a, a reboot of Family Double Dare with, where like <laughs> the losing family is executed. That, that, that's filmed yeah. on like a fucking uh, oil derrick in international waters. Like that's her long term goal here. So there's no way you could pressure either of them. So that's great. It leaves everybody else off the hook. But even if you were able to figure out a way, like hey uh, Joe, we've got the beam on your shitty uh, uh, EpiPen daughter. Then what the fuck is Mark Warner going to do or Chris Coons or any of these other Draculas? It's the it's the party. They don't want to do the shit. They have no interest in doing it. Their structure does not uh, allow them to do it. The, 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 the uh, fable that we have about these fucking uh, 
personality standing in the way of it, like the lady in her dumb boots and her anime uh, hair doing the thumbs down. That's just what gets us all riled and gets us to imagine that there is a party here beyond these individuals that actually stands for anything that you imagine could make this country livable in the near future. Oh, and then also, like, by way of prefacing this, Rod has been, um, so he's been, he's been sort of, I guess, pseudo-vacationing, pseudo-benedicting option in a European capital. But I know you guys saw the pictures of him doing, like, the hardest soy face ever. Ah! Yeah, Rod, yeah you, can, uh, you cannot hide who you are. Rod's, That's what I saw from that. Rod soy-facing in front of the oysters that he was just oh, like, boy. oh, it was... It was. It was. It, he folks, failed the Voight comp test there. <laughs> folks, it's Rod. <laughs> it's Rod. All right. So this is this is his blog post. I mean, I, I just love all of Rod's blog posts. They all they all have, and I say they all have headlines like "What's happening to America?" And directly underneath the headline is a screen cap of three animated beavers who are smiling and holding pride flags. <laughs> so like this is like so the the article begins. He goes. I went to a garden party tonight went over in the to Buddha Hills. Party. <laughs> I love how I, I love I love how fucking monastic his life is. He's eating oysters and going to garden parties in Budapest every fucking night. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. It's like that's Rod. I think I found your problem. Wherever you go, you are. <laughs> <laughs> like, he, goes here. Um, he goes. I went to a garden party tonight over in the Buddha Hills. I met there a journalist who writes about national security and defense for a Hungarian magazine. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> can, okay. okay, so he's like, yeah, obsessed with the national security of uh, Hungary, and he writes for a Hungarian magazine. He said to me, it really upsets us to see what's happening in America. It's not the America we knew. I was at Georgetown not long ago and met this student from the Midwest who wanted to go into the foreign service. I asked him what he wanted to do with his career. He said, destroy white supremacy. He is as white as I am. These are people who will be running America one of these days. Your country is tearing itself apart, and this is hard for us to see. We loved America. We looked up to it. Okay, so like, it's a very specific type of person at this garden party, which is a Hungarian defense official who loved America. <laughs> Let's just say that's, that's among us. Yeah, yeah, that's someone's imposter. Okay, the man seemed genuinely sad and uncomprehending. What could I say? I fell into conversation with two men, one a journalist, the other a retired diplomat. They spoke with awe about the speed of the collapse of our civilization. And, okay, they're, they're, they're speaking in awed tones about the collapse of our civilization at a garden party together where they're sipping wine and, and talking about what they read in the news today. And the reason that civilization is ending is because the disgusting reptile ghouls are going to staff our foreign service and uh, assassinate uh, foreign leaders and... Uh, ensure the continued hegemony of the American petrodollar are going to go from thinking that they're defending white supremacy to thinking that they're dismantling it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, because uh, uh, they agreed with what's, uh, that what's happening to America is going to happen to Hungary sooner or later. Neither of them could account for the rapidity of the collapse through rational explanation. They agree that there is something supernatural going on here. <laughs> of course there is. <laughs> of course the there is. What else could account it's for it? The, it's other always than, the devil. It's always the dark forces. It's always the dark forces. And by the way, when I, I love that this is a classic Rod piece because there about, there's about four people that he references having conversations with. One or all of them could be completely made up. Yeah. And I, I like with Rod. Usually, I, I I err on the side of these are all characters in his head. Yeah. No, he's in the Friedman world where I just assume it with a, unless I have documentary evidence that anyone they're talking about isn't real. Yeah, Rod is like he's writing the like world's longest spiritual successor to Fight Club. <laughs> <laughs> like he was just. He was just alone at like an abandoned warehouse that has like shrubbery growing all over it. <laughs> and he was like, oh, I was at a garden party with a cleric, a mage. <laughs> he goes, uh, uh, Hungary is a very secular country, so I assume they were speaking metaphorically. They weren't. <laughs> of course they weren't, Rod. They were hanging out with you. Yeah. Um, someone said to me that American culture is still immensely powerful. Nobody cares about Germany. They make great cars, okay, but what else? Nothing. America is still cool. We may be decadent as hell, but our culture still matters to these people. I shared a ca taxi back to the pest side with an American graduate student studying here. He's a Christian who reads this blog. Okay. All right. I just want to pause here for a second. Like, th th this is the next person Rod is going to have a conversation with. And again, he's talking about the just 
breakneck pace at which our, our, our civilization itself is collapsing around us. And he's going um, to a garden party on one side of Budapest, and then he's taking an Uber back to the other side of Budapest with a grad <laughs> student who reads his blog. And he goes, um, <laughs> he's a Christian who reads this blog. He said he saw the Blues Clues segment with the drag queen singing about a pride parade, including the Beaver family with the trans member sporting mastectomy scars. Okay, folks, I'm just going to read that sentence again. Uh, he's a Christian who reads this blog. He's taking a cab with me back to the other side of Budapest. He said he saw the Blues Clues segments with the drag queen singing about the pride parade, including the Beaver family with the trans member sporting mastectomy scars. He's just dropping that like it's something that we all know oh, about. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, know, the, you know, the Blues Clues segment. With the mastectomy scars and the pride flag. Oh, yeah, 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 go on, go on. He goes, That show meant a lot to me as a kid, he said. It started the year I was born. It was a big part of my childhood. Now his voice faded off. Okay, I mean, like, I, I don't know what is funny. Like, this is what I love reading Roger Ayer so much. It's like, I don't know what option is funnier. That he totally made up this grad student who's crying about blues clues in the back of a fucking taxi in Budapest. <laughs> or that he, that he actually, that actually does exists. is that he actually does spend his time at going to a guarded party and then just, you know, taking a cab home with a grad student who's a fan of my blog. <laughs> a fan of my blog and blues clues. <laughs> <laughs> He's eight years old. Yeah, it's like this is like this is it's like this is the Barney bit, like just all these adults being like, I've really been become I've become disturbed by all the themes that have been in Paw Patrol this last year. He goes here. It's like so Rabbi Amari says, look around you, said the student, look around you and you can't believe the depra depravity. You want to ask God how long? Now, that's the question Rod was asking him on the grinder before they met up. <laughs> Some, something dark and depraved is coming. It's already here, and it's going to get much worse. Prepare, prepare, prepare. These people who have lived through totalitarianism know what they're seeing. You just talked to a guy who was uh, born the year Blue's Clues debuted. What fucking totalitarianism has he lived under? But prepare, prepare, prepare. Shut the fuck up. If you believed any of this, you wouldn't be having these European vacations. Where's your compound, Rod? I know, honestly, like he is not really Benedict optioning too hard. Like where where are his, where's his root cellar? Where are his preserves? No, this is the eggs Benedict option. <laughs> He's going to brunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! And this isn't like we don't mean to offend anyone. We're not saying that this empire represented all Muslims, but it's like for the purpose of a casino where you need a singular theme. This is what we're doing. It's the Ottoman Empire themed casino. Yes, called Janissary. Janissary. Janissary yes. Yeah. So. Obviously, like the design, very important. Pillows everywhere. Everywhere. That was an <laughs> no chairs. That, you sit on a stack of pillows at all of the uh, slot All machines. the tables. Yes, and all the tables. So, like, just beautiful, like, silk drapes, like, a lot of, like, beautiful pattern designs. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, there are different, like, levels to it, sort of like an Ottoman palace. Uh, like, the high, the high roller section, you have to go through, like, a bunch of, like, silk drapes and shit. Mm -hmm. But what's important is the personnel. The dealers, like your blackjack dealer, your roulette dealer, they're going to be hulking. They're going to be taller than everyone because they're the janissaries. Right, yeah. They're, they're going to be big, a seven foot tall uh, poles. Yeah. yeah. And they're going to be wearing janissary outfits. But the pit bosses are the viziers. Right. They got the <laughs> onion head hats. Yeah. The CEO of the casino is casino is the sultan of, course. of the casino. It's f a fucking cool idea. Like, there could be a donar, every, donar yep. everywhere. There would be casino... Because in Turkey they greatly uh, they greatly value cats and they're really nice to cats. Yes, casino cats. Yes, they're, they're like they they're, they're just they live in the casino like they're nobody owns them. But they they hop on the blackjack table. That's good luck. You give them a little pet. Give them a little yeah. scratch. They're just the casino cats, but everyone respects them. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, like just a great time. Yeah. But you know, um, racists need to gamble too. <laughs> and like I don't I don't the like Trump casino is gone now. Yeah. So really <laughs> yeah. I don't like that this is a market fact, but it is. And this would be a new type of racist casino. Uh it's called Thulian. <laughs> 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 this would be the uh the 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 the, the Varg black metal themed casino. Yeah. It is, uh, yeah. It's like it's it's his version of like pre Christian uh Christ cucked Europe. Yeah, and Will like, said... Like, Middle Earth, but racist. 
Will, Will had a really good idea. But more racist, I should say. You, you guys had some really good ideas for this casino where it's like, you don't get chips, you get runes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and the, the actual games, uh, it, there's no cards. You just have to scry the runes. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then the winner is whoever wins the test of strength. Yeah. Like there's no actual, like, the, 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 the casino games is not about luck or skill. That's they're, about, they're about strength and weakness. Exactly, yeah. Because yeah, yes. gambling is Jewish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> gambling has to do with numbers. Yes, that, exactly. and money. That's it's Jewish. Jewish. Um, <laughs> the, the thing that makes both these casinos great, and like I, I, I've gone to many casinos in my life. I started when I was like eleven, and we went to Vegas for some reason. It was a fun vacation, but you know, not a lot for me to do there at the time. But sort of a lifelong love affair with casinos. Themed casinos are awesome. Absolutely. It's a bummer they're gone now. Although yeah. Now they're just these, like, they're just cubes devoted to abstract wealth. Yeah. Yeah. They just all look like, like, the newest casinos look like WeWorks. It yeah. sucks. Yeah. Uh, but the thing, even when we did have themed casinos, the thing that, like, sucked about them kind of was that, like, I guess you would have, like, themed slot machines, but, like, the games aren't, it's like, okay, how is this game of craps, like, Roman? Right. Yeah. But, Okay. In the Ottoman casino, you'll be able to bet on falcon races. <laughs> How cool is that? And well, you said, Felix, like when you went to Vegas when you were 11, there's not a lot for you to do, you know, because like, yeah. in a casino, like this, they're tr they try to have stuff for kids to do. But at Janissaries, you could like bring bring your eleven year bring your large eleven year old son and give them to the casino yeah. and they would start training them to gamble at an early age, but they would become I, property of the casino. I would have loved that. <laughs> <laughs> and then like from eleven, you were raised into adulthood to be the best gambler in the Ottoman casino. That oh man. Can I quantum suicide? So <laughs> I could have done that instead of my life now. There are like young, younger, like urban professionals um, who like they make good money and they're like, oh, let's go to Palm Springs like every other asshole. It's like, no, there's a gambling city on the East Coast. I know. Like, I love Vegas. Vegas is great. That's good for your big vacation. But like for a long weekend, I wish if more people from like Philadelphia, and New York, who make good money as like creative directors or whatever the fuck came here. It would economically revitalize this place. You would have to make a casino for them, you oh, know, no. like M. Hoffs or something. <laughs> <laughs> make, um, can make Brad Trammell oh the creative yeah, director of yeah. M. Hoffs oh Casino. My oh yeah. my god! <laughs> oh my god! The, the, the cocktail waitresses are wearing like knit minions outfits. <laughs> yeah, they have goggles and cowboy boots on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you no! Know, if you're against, like, if you're like, oh, I hate wokeness, start gambling. It's true. There's yeah. no woke. It's true. You go to <laughs> the, yeah. the slot machines. They have never heard of cultural appropriation, or if they heard, have, they think it's good. Yeah. There should be. There should be a like. They've never done this, obviously, because of like so many of the people who come here are just like it's like ancient Jewish guys from Long Island. But it would be fun if there was. Uh, <laughs> slot machine. That was just like well, the happy it's merchant, the greedy Jew. Yeah. <laughs> Because they have everything else. Rabbi's like, treasure. Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi's treasure. <laughs> he's like running to make sure you don't get his treasure that's buried in the Torah. Thinking. If, there is a, if you can think of any other product in any other industry that has killed more than 5,000 people stated in the VAERS database, and even if only half of those are true, 200, 2,500 deaths in six months of use, and it's still full court press, full steam ahead. So it makes one have to wonder why. Why are we still doing this? Why are we putting people into nursing homes like that happened in New York and put people with with known COVID into places? I love her. Yeah. Yeah. She's such uh, a you know, I need to smoke a blunt with this facts. bitch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that, that was that was that was that was Dr. Tenpenny talking about how dangerous the vaccine is. <laughs> um, in the context of talking about how we don't need the vaccine because COVID is not dangerous. So the, yeah. let's just say by for conservative right. estimate, the twenty five hundred people killed by the vaccine is a bigger public health threat than like, again, let's be just take the cut the numbers in half, the three hundred thousand people killed by, <laughs> yeah, by COVID. <laughs> but um, let, let's get into some more of the details about about what, uh, what so sort of the superpowers that the vaccine can grant you. And some of the information that I think had been discussed on your podcast related to EMF frequencies. That was a thought. 
And that was seeking to raise because now, because right now we're all yeah, she came on hypothesizing. Uh, episode I mean, what 68 is it on Patreon. Being transmitted that's causing all of these things. Is it a combination of the protein, which now we're finding has a metal attached to it? I'm sure you've seen the pictures all over the internet of people who've had these shots and now they're magnetized. They can put a key on their no. forehead, it sticks. They can put spoons and forks all over them and they can stick. Because now we think that there's a metal piece to that. There has been people who've long I, suspected that there was some sort of an interface, yet to be defined, an interface between what's being injected in these shots and I all love of the, the quotes around towers. interface. Not proven yet, but we're trying to figure out what is it that's being transmitted to no, these not unvaccinated proven. people. Very judicious of her. Yeah, no, yes. this is, look, she's, she's not, she, she, she's not going to go out on a, on a limb here. She's going to make very qualified yeah. statements about how the, the vaccine may interface with 5G towers, and we've all seen the videos <laughs> of it magnetizing people. I just love okay, that she's, she's literally upset, like, spitting we, facts. We've all seen, we've all seen the video. spitting facts. We've all also, seen the, the video. The, the entire cast behind her looks like a full room of wet brains. <laughs> like yeah. she had to get someone that would believe all of this. Okay, she. Yeah, it's like, it's like in the like look fat video. How the only people in the audience are just like like Iowa manatees yes. who when jo- Joe goes like look fat, they're like. Mm. <laughs> they like yeah. in approval. Everyone they all there, look like they share there, the same brain cell. <laughs> yeah, everyone there just that—that that is the fluoride stare. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, just, I, I, I like. I love the idea about the the vaccine giving making you magnetic because it's like, look, even if twenty five hundred people have been killed by this vaccine, I think that's a small price to pay for creating a certain like. A, a sort of stable of X Men like powers in the larger, literally. So larger. And I was literally, yeah. I was literally about to bring up the sounds like the plot line for the upcoming X Men. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, in my, my favorite thing that um, Doctor Tenpenny said. She claimed to have spent, I think it was eleven thousand hours studying vaccine data. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you factor the numbers, how how many hours it's been since the state of uh, state of emergency in Ohio? That's twenty two hours a day. <laughs> so she's, and honestly, that I I believe it. She's on yeah. something. Um, I want to be a ten penny. She's cranked up. Yeah. Okay. I just don't understand how he how someone who's a Huff Post contributor has gotten to this. Pa- point of power. Well, Jacques, that's the, that's the interesting thing about this article is that it's, it's, it's like a lot of this stuff doesn't add up and it never really mm. comes to any satisfying conclusion why this like a mm. guy who used like started out in movies and then was like Gavin Newsom's assistant and then it was like a sometime Huffington Post contributor has this like such all this juice with like all these different people who are like high up in the media. Um, and in fact, it, it, gets, it, gets, it gets even weirder because um, it says, uh, hold on, let me just find it. Okay, so it goes, how Ali acquired so many powerful supporters is a bit of a mystery. Even his closest allies are a bit fuzzy about how they met. I don't remember how we became friends, says New York Times Washington correspondent Maggie Haberman. Zucker has a hard time recalling, too. That's a really good question. How do I know, Yashar? So does (laughs) does CNN anchor Jake Tapper. I couldn't tell you how we met, but suddenly he was a presence in my life. A wonderful one, he says. It just feels like he's always been in my life, but I don't know that I've ever met him in person. So, like, when I read this, like, Yashark sort of sounds like Robert Blake in Lost Highway. Like, you're just at a party, and he just, he just, he just appears and is just like, I'm in your house right now. I've always been there. And you're like, oh, Yashar, he's a bon vivant and a raconteur and an animal rights activist, and he's just, he's just there. How'd you get inside my house? You invited me. It is not my custom to go where I am not wanted. His, his job with Newsom brought him into frequent contact with the city's wealthy and well-connected donors. None more impressive than Susie Tompkins Buell, the billionaire co-founder of apparel brands eSpirit and The North Face, is also one of the Democratic Party's top donors. She's given tens of millions to support the presidential campaigns of Bill Clinton, Al Gore, John Kerry, and her close friend Hillary Clinton. Ali and Buell first met at a political dinner around 2008 and soon became very friendly, trading small talk at political events and gossip over drinks. As their relationship deepened, he advised her on art purchases, helped her recoup a valuable book that had been stolen, and organized an auction of her furniture. I love the detail about helping her recoup a valuable book that had been stolen. It's like, like he's like Johnny Depp's character in The Ninth Gate, and the book is like the Necronomicon or something. Yeah. Oh, he, probably, like, he probably engineered the theft yeah, of that no, book. That, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, how would you get the yeah. book back? He was charging. Sure, like, he was yeah. charging fees for all of it. Where he's like, yeah, "Oh, I'll yeah. sell your art. I'm taking a very generous." He, like, he was getting his bag. Let's let's be completely honest. <laughs> and and you know what? We absolutely stand that. Yeah, we absolutely probably, stand that. Like, he's like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones, but like if all Littlefinger wanted was like 
a, a man cave in a celebrity's house and like retweets. Yeah. He's awesome. Yeah. He's awesome. Sorry, I don't, I don't think... watch The Devil's Show. I don't get All right, the reference. I'm sorry. I, I wish I could be the same type of person, like how Yashar is to like these, these lib dullards. Like, I wish I could be the same type of person, uh, like as for like Amy Therese, uh, Red Kahina. Uh, Dr. Naomi Wolf, like th- th- those kinds of cranks, Red. like that would be so fucking awesome. Can you imagine like be- like being the guy who like delivers Red Kahina's like uh, government dementia medicine or whatever? Like uh, you-, you get to dementia. live in-, in 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 a spare room in her like rent controlled twenty twenty five dollar a month apartment in the upper Upper West Side that she's lived in since the eighties. Like it-, it must be so nice. This is here uh, by then. Ali had also befriended heiress Adria, Ariadne Getty, a member of the San Francisco-based oil dynasty that has backed Newsom throughout his political career. Ali and the heiress, an extremely private person who in recent years has been a major donor to LGBTQ causes, became close through Ali's work for Newsom, and soon he was flying in regularly from San Francisco to visit Getty at her $14 million condo at the Beverly Hills Montague. But sources say that their relationship began to sour after Ali began borrowing large sums of money from her in 2012. In a civil complaint she filed against Ali in 2017, Getty claims that the loans totaled $179,000. The former friends reached an agreement under which Ali promised to pay the heiress back in monthly installments. He made only two of those payments before defaulting, according to court documents. The debt is still outstanding. But like, Pimp. if you're the Pimp. heiress to That's the Getty, taxes right if, there. If you're the heiress to the Getty fortune, like. I know. Just lending some How are Twitter people so easy to reach? Dollars is that's that's pocket change for you. And like you, if if you if like, if you lend someone that sum of money and you are the Getty heiress, I don't think you should be like. I don't think they should be required to pay you back. No. Yeah. Did you all. earn that? Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, yeah, if I've yeah. learned anything from Unsolved Mysteries, it's that the rich can always be manipulated and charmed <laughs> out of their money and into your, their wills and hearts. <laughs> that is that like is so every true. episode <laughs> about an old woman being befriended by a... It's all about your char. Your char is in every single episode. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20 years of unsolved mysteries and all it's, it's always all been him. yashar yeah the, the season recap episode is just yashar in, a, in an empty studio just like uh <laughs> live tweeting uh by then ali had found a new friend in the spring of 2017 comedian kathy griffin's life was quickly unraveling following a photo shoot photo shoot in which she posed holding a prop resembling donald trump's decapitated head death threats poured in by the thousands griffin was promptly fired from her gig at cnn venues canceled her upcoming comedy tour and lucrative endorsement deals disappeared overnight the secret service launched an investigation griffin was as radioactive as a celebrity could get desperate she turned to an unlikely saver savior one of her favorite twitter personalities who's often been complimentary about her on the platform she DM'd Ali, and as fate would have it, they discovered a weird connection. They both attended the same high school in Chicago. I mean, again, this is just like this weird thing that everyone... It does like, none of it makes like, sense. They've always He's known each other. Artist. And it's, uh, yeah. it's sort of like in, a, in Blood Meridian, where like all the characters had like, have, like independently <laughs> met Judge Holden before the narrative <laughs> starts. It's just like they, they all like weirdly run into him like for, yeah. in their past, and like he's just always been there. And it's all just been this culmination of him... Like the gravity of of his just in sort of incalculable like uh, gnostic archon like uh, power, just drawing people yeah. in. And, but like from the I moment they were born, he's the he's the er NPC. I thought you said also he's from Iran. Did he grow up in Chicago he's, or yeah, Iran? he's Iranian American? I believe. Yeah, I think his parents his parents are from Iran. But um, I mean that makes that checks out too. <laughs> <laughs> Elaborate. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What, I don't know where you're going there, Chuck. I'm just thinking. Yeah, you're you thinking. Know, yeah, I know. I get it. I'm, I get it. You know. But yeah, no, I love I the feel- Kathy Griffin thing. I I would imagine like if I were to do this, it would be like. Fuck Kathy Griffin. I have nowhere else to stay. The Getty heiress kicked me out. I've got to go to like the lowest of the low, the most desperate of the desperate, which is Kathy Griffin, who's just like you know renowned hag. Needs to have a gay guy around her at all times. So like you go, yes. you start crashing at the mansion. You would have to hang out with her for like two weeks. But then you're like, okay, I've put I've put my penny in the emotional piggy bank. I'm now like creating a, a man cave upstairs and just like avoiding <laughs> her at all costs and making that work for like eight months is just it's so sick. So when now, we, we man- didn't get this detail in the in the article, but what are the odds? Piss jars, yay or nay? <laughs> Your sharp piss yeah. jar. Oh, I I've as someone who had to use piss jars due to extenuating circumstances of having a lofted bedroom, uh, we spot our own. But I don't think he does it habitually. I think he's like, you know, 
he's been in a situation where he's it's more optimal to do that. I would pee in a jar to avoid. I'd pee in a jar to avoid <laughs> Kathy Griffin. Yeah, no. like, who are you? To share her Howard bathroom. Hughes? I wish. Um, so, oh, so God. he says, uh, um, uh, says here. Um, initially, they discussed simply doing an interview to clear up the Trump matter, but as their relationship grew closer. <laughs> Ali morphed into Griffin's unofficial advisor and shadow publicist. He introduced Griffin to sympathetic journalists, schooled her in the intricacies of social media, and strategized about which publications and late-night talk shows would best serve her career rehabilitation. Eventually, And, and it took, worked. It worked. Yeah, she's back. Um, yeah. So this is great. On one evening in the fall of 2018, Griffin invited journalist Joan Walsh, the national affairs correspondent for the Nation and former political analyst for CNN and MSNBC, to join her for dinner. After Ali made an appearance, Walsh began probing Griffin about the nature of her relationship with him. Walsh says she got the sense that Griffin wanted Ali to leave but was too intimidated to force the issue. I completely believe that she was uncomfortable and maybe even afraid, and I sympathize with her, said Walsh. After listening to Griffin's story and seeing her evident anxiety, Walsh told her host, Kathy, you got yourself a grifter. You have to get him out of here. <laughs> and I just... Hater. Hater. Yeah. Hater alert. Cop. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you're Shar walks in and Kathy Griffin's like kicking this woman under the table and like blinking at her like help <laughs> help <laughs> I'm uh. gonna get Yashar Ali at his own game and I'm gonna take all the money you're gonna become back. friends with Kathy Griffin before he can <laughs> you I mean, outscan red, him is what you red do. haired women have always loved me mm -hmm. I don't understand why Kathy Amy Griffin Adams watch out we're gonna be getting yeah, contacted very soon what's that what's that KKK princess <laughs> Ellie <that> Kemper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yo, this Actually, is, oh my god, she's, she's, she's in a very vulnerable she's, place she's right in now. A very vulnerable position. Yeah. She is fresh meat for any gay guy who needs to scam Ellie Kemper. Please Dude, drop it, in. Find you yourself. You can, find yourself. A, get you a veiled prophet, fellas. Yes. If your girl is like a, you help God. Ellie Kemper yes. out of that, that's a good nine month stay at her mansion. Uh, her, her, uh, Titus, mean, we, we, we can just recruit recruit Matt. To do that, her, we could just dress him up in robes, and, and he'll be like a perfect fit. <laughs> yes, her castmate Titus has already gone off his limbs to prove that she's innocent and fine. I'm sure it's so, like I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. know. I, if if I, I was nine, fine. Yeah, if, it's like, it's if fine. I was 19 and in a beauty pageant, I wouldn't be paying attention to the moral and ethnic <laughs> uh, background yeah, a, of this you're a beauty pageant I'm in a anyway. You're beauty getting contest. Contest. Jacques, yeah. Jacques was crowned like the prince of a yellow king ceremony. <laughs> yeah. when he, when he was like 19, and was like Jacques, Jacques was Miss Carcosa yeah. three years running. Yeah. I used to just I didn't pay attention to all the weird shit. That was happening. I used I, I, I used to have this in a cave. Y'all, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I had no clue. <laughs> Y'all, shut. I up. didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> Look, I didn't know that that pageant was sponsored by the Grey Wolves. I thought it was a complete... I thought it was the Maroon Wolves, which are fine. Um, how's it going, fellas? How was your weekend? Uh, you know, uh, did what I usually do, but uh, now that, you know, movies are out again, you know, I, I've done what everyone does during quarantine. We all, we've all done it. It's all part of the new normal. Uh, you know, I could go into the whole thing about how... Uh, you know, the world's crazy now. The best golfer is a woman. The best rapper is a woman. The three most powerful guys are uh, Bush, Colin, and Biden. All that. But, you know, we know it. But, you know, one of those rituals that we've all done, I get uh, Annie's uh, canned biscuits, and I sit on them till they're warm. <laughs> and then I stick my finger in them to simulate finger blasting while I watch a movie. Except now that the theaters are back, I want to enjoy In the Heights while doing that. But I, I couldn't concentrate on the simulated finger blasting, which I'm not, do, I'm not doing because it like gets me horny. I'm doing it because, like, for practice. Technique. Uh, yeah, if I ever do that again. Um, I couldn't concentrate on that because it was too busy clapping along to all the Washington style, Washington Heights style hits in that film. Washington Heights! I have no financial relationship with In the Heights or Lin-Manuel Miranda. I just enjoyed doing this. Was your movie-going experience um, interrupted at any point when any of the local youths found out that you were fingering dough and decided to yell it at the entire theater? They called me a very bad word I can't repeat. <laughs> 
I don't think it really matters what your policies are, how good they are, how in line they are with the supposed beliefs of the electorate. Because like the electorate doesn't really know what they want. Not not really. Yeah. I think they just you know want like Joe, a strong, competent leadership or the or the impression of strong, competent leadership. You know when Joe Biden won? Joe Biden he won when that like Stephen Crowder wannabe guy asked him, like, how oh, how many genders are there? And he was like, I don't know, man, at least three. It just didn't give a shit. That's when he won. You know when he almost lost. You know why it was like kind of close because of he 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 looked like a bitch in that first debate. That's it. That's it. That's all that fucking matters. That's all that matters. The last presidential election. No one knows. Like like if you went to Joe's, who first of all who goes to Joe's website to look at the policies? No one who voted for him. I love it. yeah, Yeah. No one who voted for him in the primary. They like it when he gets up there and like calls the guy fat and like stumbles around and tells a perfectly remembered story from 70 years ago and then is convinced he's in 1981 and is talking to Casper Weinberger. They like that. They well, like I mean, the image of Joe. Felix, you're right. Like he won, the, he won the majority share of voters who said that they were for Medicare for All after being the only candidate who explicitly said he was against it. And then most of the things he did say he ran on, they've either gone back on or, or like, like actually like cut 180 degrees against the thing that they said that they were going to deliver if you voted for them. And guess what? His approval rating is like in the fucking in the in the 60s overall and among fucking and registered Democratic voters, I would imagine even higher than that. Look, it's not going to do him any favors in the long term if he needs to like, you know, I don't know, win a midterm election or anything. But like, that's not a concern to them. They don't care about that. No, they don't give a shit. No one in the, no one like quoted in this article gives a shit. And no. Yeah. I mean, well, well, Joe is sort of the perfection of that Obama model where it's like really who cares and in fact we'd prefer to lose congress but we'll have a popular executive forever well joe is like more built to be that eternally popular executive way more than obama yeah you just bring him out there in front of a green screen once every two weeks have him tell some weird fucking story have him have the saint patrick's day bonanza every year <laughs> that's perfect for him this is a job he was born to do. Uh, by the way, uh, Joe Biden is overseas right now for all like the G7 summits, and he's meeting with uh, the Queen of England, uh, Erdogan, and uh, a meeting, <laughs> meeting with Putin coming up this week. Did you see when he, he met the Queen of England, and he was like, she, she reminds me of my she mom. She reminds man. me of my mom. And it's like, she's five years older than you. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That, but again, like that's why he won. That's yeah. why he won. None of this shit matters. It, it's like, that's why he won. If you think Joe Biden won the White House or the Democratic primary or continues to be a, by modern accounts, an overwhelmingly popular president because of any policy he has enacted or supported, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, compare that. Okay, compare Joe to any Democratic candidate like since Clinton. Compare him to John Kerry or Al Gore. Like, what, could you imagine Kerry or Gore saying that to the Queen? No. Could you imagine them like... Like being like, man, it used to be 10 years ago. It was gay bathhouse. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> was taking poppers. <laughs> like, that's it. That's it. That's the Joe Biden story. And he nearly blew it because they didn't give him enough Adderall at the first debate. That's it. That's I, it. That's your fucking story. I, I just think like I, I, the story of Joe. She writes, conservatives warned about this, of course. People with one ounce of forethought knew exactly where massive unemployment perks would lead. You can't pay people handsomely to stay home and then expect them to jump back into the Chipotle uniforms. But this whole Chipotle price... Would I, you ever do yeah, that job? You would, would never... You ever fucking you would, do that she job? Would, never would anyone you know? Yeah. You would never do that. You would never fucking do that. She goes... But this whole pro Chipotle price hike reveals another thing about conservatives. Have, another thing conservatives have long been right about: when companies have to raise their wages, they don't absorb those costs; they pass them off on you. In an effort to bring an additional twenty thousand workers, Chipotle announced in May that it would raise the hourly average wage to fifteen dollars by the end of the month, the same dollar figure Democrats have pushed as a federal minimum wage. Give people a living wage, they demand, for entry-level jobs that were never intended to support full families. Oh, well, they were never intended to, but I got news for you about what they are now. I mean, yeah, what where, are you talking about? Where are the other jobs? What year do you live? Jobs? Where are the other jobs for people that are supposed to support full families? Can they just get a job in a fucking factory? Well, I mean, they should get, a, they should get a job for it? a think tank or a magazine like The yeah. Federalist that is funded entirely out of pocket by some fucking vampire that is that, exactly that has no, as absolutely like uh, 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 Kelly Zim Kylie Zimple's writing has never once been subject to any market force ever. 
for clicks, are, yeah. for views, for ad dollars, for fucking for uh, against better writers. She's never had any competition. It's just if if you're if you're a conservative college student, you're fed into these fucking programs, and they give you a make work job at some place like the Federalist. If you if you have no shame and you come from a family background where this kind of thinking is, uh, I don't know, encouraged, then like you got it made. You got it made. Yeah, this is. Um Usually when we read, like, goofy, conservative, like, Federalist things, it's, like, fun and, like, it's hard to get too mad at a lot of them because a lot of them are so patently ridiculous, right? Like, you know, a lot of them are like, oh, you know, I I, I called the police because, you know, a, a child on my block, like, dressed up like little Xan for Halloween. Like, I saw temporary tattoos and I had a panic attack. I like I I some insane personal problem or like Rod Dreher where it gets like a little dark like the exorcism story but it's still so like they're so alien to me that it's like kind of funny but this is just like this is so fucking repulsive because yeah that's exactly it like writing is such an easy job already if you can I'm sorry like if, if you dedicate yourself to it and you can't do it like you probably just suck I'm sorry yeah and then to even take what little like market force there is out of writing and to be this person and like demand people just shuffle into these soul crushing positions like there's anything like there's any other fucking job for people that like uh, don't have a college degree or even do just have a four year degree and no personal or who just don't like, have the conservative so social network repulsive. to just give you a fucking job like this at the Federalist like do you think, do you think Kylie Zemper has ever been paid in her writing career anything close to what a market would actually like demand that she earn for the articles like no. give me cheaper burritos? Yeah, no. Who if Kylie Zemper left the Federal List, who would follow her? What list of subscribers would come? Or is she just she's sort of like the literary equivalent of someone shoveling slop at Chipotle? Yeah, yeah. but getting paid a hell of a lot more and probably with way them, more. Some, I don't know. Having a way easier life, never having to worry about the things they worry about. So she goes here, uh, they demand, uh, give people a living wage, they demand, for entry-level jobs that were never intended to support full families. All the while, they shush conservatives who protest that a $15 minimum wage at McDonald's, for instance, would raise prices, harming many of the same low-income Americans who dine there. That's exactly what's been happening at McDonald's. Not if their wages are higher, too. Yes, exactly. They can fucking afford it. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> well, the thing here that I enjoy, though, is that, and this whole genre that has emerged uh, in the last few months, uh, these articles freaking out about unemployment, is that it does reveal uh, the, the coercion, the, the repressive uh, force at the heart of capitalism that is obscured by the fact that, that the thing that is making people go to work is just the threat of poverty, the threat of hunger, the threat of losing your uh, home or your health insurance. Because that's not you know, uh, that's not being carried out by the state explicitly in the form of, you know, an army of, 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 of uh, overseers or something. It becomes invisible. Uh, but when people are, are like, get back to work, fucking peons, uh, or it, it's wrong for you to not fear uh, starvation uh, more uh, than working a demeaning, very, very low wage job. They're showing, oh, yeah, this thing actually is as coercive as any of the horrible systems that they claim to be opposing. Well, it's just that the coercion is is invisibilized. Well, yeah, and here they're just putting it right out in the open. Is that, is that it seems like it's all free. Like in the free market, yeah. it's just like these are just contracts being entered to by free individuals. And if, hey, if you don't want the demeaning job, you don't have to do it. Well, in order for it to be a free, like a free decision or an actual negotiation, there would have to be an option of surviving without work. It would have yes. to be like a generous social welfare system. And on top of that, a UBI that would basically be like a permanent federal unemployment insurance that could make it so that, yeah, you could get by with not just not working a job. And that way, if you choose to work a job, well, then, well, then that choice actually means something. It's a choice that you're actively making rather than being, you know, disciplined through the, mar through the fear of poverty or starvation into doing. Just cl finishing out here, it says... Um, that's exactly what's been happening at McDonald's, where the traditional dollar menu has become a relic of the past and prices have soared as wages have gone up. I mean, like, I, I understand, like, the restaurant businesses, like, in the restaurant business right now, like, prices are going up because, like, they, they're having to pay a lot more for things like meat and fish or whatever. But for a company like McDonald's, like, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if the dollar menu is still there or not, but, like, are, are their prices rising dramatically? 
I, I went to. I, I went to. I got uh, there now. I believe I was just there the other day. Uh, the BTS meal. Uh, it is five dollars per nugget. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the BTS. If you meal. if you if you can't buy the same amount of food for one dollar that you could literally twenty years ago, yeah, call the police. Just get get like repurpose ice to force people into these positions until there is literally no inflation in the price of food. It exists in everything else. It exists in housing. It exists in cars. It exists everything else that you don't give a shit about. But like, if you can't get the same amount of food, this is a grand societal problem. If there's any inflation in food prices over a twenty year period, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, she she finishes out here saying. When the federal government pays restaurant workers to stay home, home is where many of them will stay. And when Chipotle needs to compensate for it by dangling a 15-hour minimum wage, a 15-hour ma- wage in front of the low-skill teens who work there. Okay, I'm sorry. It is not low-skill teens who are working at McDonald's and Chipotle anymore. I mean, some of them are, but a lot of these are just people with families. I never. And, I, and, I, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry. The wage that they're paying wasn't intended to support a family when we started the service economy well, that doesn't in this mean country. Anything. That's but it doesn't gibberish. mean that doesn't, anything. It never meant anything. What, what the fuck? It, uh, the, what, what, there was there ever a time when restaurants weren't open during school days? <laughs> yeah. Was there ever a time yeah. when you go to McDonald's at three in the afternoon on a weekday and it was closed? That was never true. So therefore, those jobs were always for adults. Just, what you, adult? Jo- what adult job? Should the people working in Chipotle get, according to her? Well, I mean, like, I, I think, I think, like, I think if you, I think if you put that to her, she would just say, "Well, they need, they, they should have invested their time earlier in life and skills so that they could get a job writing for the Federalist. They should have gone to college." If ever, or yeah, but that is her. Like, oh, they should have gone to college. Well, if everyone goes to college, that doesn't increase the amount of jobs. You fucking dingbat. If she worked at Chipotle, she would toss her fucking. She would drown herself in the cilantro vat within the first hour. <laughs> So she like, so gets here uh, by dangling a fifteen dollar an hour wage in front of the low skill teens who work there. I just love that phrase, low skill teens. Like, what a fucking, what a, what a fucking, what a rude thing to say to people who fucking. Make You're a low food. skill adult, yeah. and you'll never be anything <laughs> yeah. but that. You have no skills. If I left you in the woods, you would be like fucking, fu- fucking vultures would be circling you within a minute. <laughs> Within a fucking minute, you have nothing. You're nobody. I could launch you into space, and then an identical fucking blonde woman with like uneven dimples would replace you. Wait, I feel like no how did one you guess fucking this woman cares. Was how did you guess she was blonde? <laughs> Federalist writer. Yeah, <laughs> Kylie Zimple. <laughs> I gotta say, uh, I I don't think I'd want to meet a high skilled team. That yeah. they sound terrifying to me. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> So I, have here. A, I have a certain set of, set of skills. I always know who imposter is. Goaded. <laughs> <laughs> it goes here. Uh, so Dude, put that in the promo. It's sort of like in in a way like we, like it, it, the language is so focused on 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 facing up to the past. And like I said, like and but it, but in the context of the, of current savage inequalities in American politics and culture, and that like it's the insistence that we we can't do we like we can't fix any of these current problems now until we address and like encounter the past in like in a specific way. And it's this, 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 this intense focus on sort of uh, owning up to or, or facing our past and like, or, but like, but also, also not really look, it, it's sort of like, it, but it, not to say that's wrong, but it, it lacks a sort of focus on like, what can we learn from the past? Or like, like, is there, a, is there a model for the future here? Totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's it's you know beyond the sort of materialist critique that like you know this this is being used and I think I probably wouldn't uphold the most aggressively sort of cynical version although it, it, it does probably work in for a number of, in a number of cases here but I think there are a num- there are a lot of people who are sincerely committed to this sort of radical revision of the past on its own terms and are you know more or less indifferent to the you know the material and the political alliances that they may be you know uh, inadvertently advancing uh you know in effect by kind of endorsing this this these these you know culture war politics of history but but i think even on its own terms and this is really was the sort of the teeth of the piece was even beyond the fact that oh you know um we know that nicole hannah jones hates bernie sanders blah 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 but beyond the 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 actual political positioning i feel like the 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 issue for me with 1619 with, uh, you know, other iterations of this uh, uh, of this sort of big critical take on American history. Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, this massive bestseller, is kind of follows along these same lines. Is this sort of the airlessness and the futurelessness of this of this vision of history, the, the motionlessness of it? The idea that you draw a straight line from 
a sort of a dark origin to a permanent essence. You know, these metaphors of America's DNA and original sin, it's biblical and biological. I mean, these are, as far as I can tell, just philosophically reactionary ways to understand human history that, you know, to me is a, is a story of, of movement and struggle and uh, possibility. And yeah, you have, you know, you have heroic victories and you have crushing defeats. And from the, from the left perspective, the latter are a lot more common than the former. But to, to, to sort of, in effect, write a lot of that struggle out of history, which I, I really do feel that many of the, the, the current kind of continuity and origin focus history does, is I think not only... Um, you know, problematic in its in its sort of the material alliances that are that are that are happening. But I think it's it's a dead end philosophically, intellectually, and politically because you 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 end up you know you end up paralyzing yourself. Previously, the kind of liberal liberal orthodoxy about American history is that um, there's all these, there's all these bad things in it, but it always follows this. You know, there's this um, there's a tragic element to it, but it's always following along this trajectory of improvement. That, you know, like uh, you quote um, uh, Bill Clinton in your piece and his famous quote that uh, there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed by what's right with America. The Obama phrase that I think is along the same lines is, you know, the what is it, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice as a kind of um, guarantor of, of, of sort of smooth movement towards, you know, the moral right. But. Uh, a kind of uh, a basic possibility that allows radical struggle to sort of seize that right. For liberals, I don't know, under the age of 50, it's just not, it's just deeply unpersuasive right now. That, um, and and I think the result, unfortunately, has not been to sort of, I mean, and this is, this is for, this is for material reasons, and this does have to do with the sort of the decline of the working class and the decline of organized labor in politics. But but, you know, the, 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 the dissatisfaction and the kind of palpable um, inadequacy of that narrative, of that kind of like, uh, of, of the sort of the patness of this, this arc of progress idea um, has produced, you know, what Matt was talking about. You know, this kind of uh, these, this particular, you know, strain form of, 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 if you could call it radicalism, that, uh, you know, I talked about actually the, the scholar Wendy Brown, the theorist Wendy Brown wrote about this really powerfully 20, 30 years ago. She saw this coming. She really called her shot that this kind of disbelief in the future that I think has affected not just liberals, but broad sections of the left, too. You know, since mm-hmm. the, the fall of um, Berlin Wall, et cetera. And not that not even if you weren't invested in the specific, you know, communist project. Um, there's, there's a, there's a palpable loss of faith, you know, on the, on the broad left too. I mean that, you know, you guys might share, but, uh, and, and what Wendy Brown talked about was that with losing this belief in progress, which really was a thing that, um, you know, lots of Marxists believed in too, you know, not, not, not that, um, not that, not that it would automatically arrive, but that, you know, the, the sort of science of history would, was absolutely going to vindicate, um, proletarian revolution. Losing that, losing that faith is it, it, there is a kind of, um, you know, combined with all the, as I said, the material things that are happening, there's a kind of it's an ungre you know, she calls it an ungrievable loss where it's like, OK, we don't believe in history as theology. We don't believe we have a destiny or horizon or anything. This is leftists and liberals. And, uh, you know, so what what do we turn to? Who do we hold responsible for that? You know, who do we hold culpable for that? Well, in, in many cases, we hold the past culpable for it. We we turn to prosecute the sins and crimes and, you know, genetic uh, malformations of, of the past, um, which is, an, is a morally attractive move because they are so flagrant. They are so hideous. You know, the history of American slavery and racial oppression since slavery is undeniable and, and, and disgusting. And yet um, the kind of the idea to sort of that that is going to be the replacement for a belief in, you know, uh, for, for, for a belief in a sort of egalitarian revolution that, pro- that produces a, a, an egalitarian future is, 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 is really problematic because you end up, you know, gnawing on your own, on your own elbows and you end up, um, you know, going in search of something that can never give you, uh, you go in search of, you know, Virginia planters instead of Goldman Sachs. And it, it can never give you, um, leaving aside the, the sort of the political alliance that you need to build to sort of challenge capital, the power of capital, 
you can't even intellectually get started if you're if you're if you're trapped into this worldview. Well, actually, speaking of crank, uh, this is the perfect segue into an old friend of ours, an old friend of the show. I'm talking about really. Um, I'm actually uh, recording this uh, show now on uh, the original Blue Yeti mic I got to uh, when we started being like, oh, hey, we, audio should be sound good on a podcast. And it still has the baseball crank sticker on the base of it. So the baseball crank is honestly like a foundational figure to the Chapo mythos. And honestly, like, I feel guilty because we haven't talked about crank in a long time. Very, it's um, been a while. Motherfuckers act like they forgot about crank. But he came back this week with a, a pseudo controversy that I loved because it involved... I would say probably the only funny thing that Baseball Crank has ever tweeted. I mean, honestly, give the guy credit for, for finding a, that squirrel finding a nut eventually after years of posting. Yeah, he, I mean, he's done unintentionally funny things before. I think he did one of the funniest things I've ever seen, which was his blog post on September 12th, 2001, Why Baseball Still Matters. So this was, um, okay, I mean, you guys, uh, I'm sure you guys saw the, note, the, new, the news that, um, the, the Biden's dog champ was uh, is no more. He was and, you know obviously to a permanent end. whether it was behavioral <laughs> issues or not, I don't know. I mean, but dog killing is back in a big way. It's the hottest thing. I mean, we are trendsetters here. We we shown we shown a light onto the huge American subculture of people who adopt dogs to kill them. And has it spread to the White House? I don't know. But, um, was there a woman in the room with Champ in a uh, in some sort of dark ceremonial robe with a jade inlaid dagger, <laughs> who was doing some sort of uh, 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 eldritch chant before she uh, split him open? I mean, we don't know for sure. There's no way of finding out. We don't know. Well, Champ is going to live in that 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 big old country farm in the sky. Uh, I mean, you know, like people are people are you know a lot of prayers up for the Biden family. A lot, of, but curiously, no word on Major. We're Folk, where's mm. Major? Every time I go to the debate stage, I'm going to say, where's Major? Where's Major Biden? Where's Major at? Champ is no more, but Major is still around somewhere. We don't know. I, um, so, yeah, I feel like I think this is probably how the Trump people felt, you know, when the, the Bannon faction was pushed out and the Javanka faction started winning and he just started governing like Mike Marco Rubio as if he would have done anything else. Um I feel like I was part of a contingent of patriotic Americans who loved huge, dirty, poorly behaved dogs. And I feel like the globalists have sort of killed Champ. Well, uh, Baseball Crank has been killing it. Uh, yeah. and, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he's Kiki. I mean, Champ has been, he's died once, but he's been killed again by the Baseball Crank in uh, the following tweet. So Dan McLaughlin, the Baseball Crank, tweeted uh, over the weekend, uh, Champ Biden dies, Major lives on. The Biden family tragedy in miniature. <laughs> and to which he received a tidal wave of outrage replies. Oh, my God. Uh, including from I'm just just right after the I'm looking at Tommy Vitor and John Favreau, who replied to Baseball Crank, you are a truly awful person. And then Favreau says, imagine how utterly broken you must be to proudly display that level of public cruelty to other human beings. Obama made jokes about drone striking teenagers. That, yeah, like you probably he, wrote, Favreau buddy. probably wrote those yeah, fucking jokes like, for the correspondence center. The Jonas brothers are here. They're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans. But uh, boys don't get any ideas. I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. Well, Felix, you had a really good point that like, in, in, in the past, before this, this wretched modern era that we all live in, if you were a gay guy, like the gayest thing you could do was join the military of any country. The, and if, you, the, were real, and if yeah. you were like a, like 100% like just a pussy destroyer, you would be, you could go into theater. You'd become yeah. an actor. No, yeah, that's the thing is like, it, one, who is one of the greatest military leaders of all time? Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great, baby. Frederick the Great was gayer than any modern man. Like he was... If he saw a woman, he would be like, oh, fucking gross. Get that fucking shit out of here. Fuck you. You want to look at that fucking gash? Get her out of here. Ugh. I'm going to fucking throw up. Get me some dudes. Uh, and uh, very tough guy, like brilliant commander. But that was more the norm for like great military commanders. And like, like not even you go even like to World War II. Like, was it Eisenhower who was like, 
I think I'm gonna leave my wife and have an. Aff- I'm gonna marry. Yeah, a yeah, yeah. He tried to <laughs> in the middle of, in the middle of the war. He sent his fucking resignation to um, Marshall uh, and said, "I'm in love with my Jeep driver, <laughs> uh, and I'm and I'm getting divorced, and I'm gonna uh, resign." And he just said, "It's fucking World War II. <laughs> I, can you get it together? Like it's like not even gay. Like sometimes, like even if they're not gay, like Queenie." Like Pat, yeah. oh, MacArthur, like for God's sake. MacArthur, Patton, Patton, Patton. of his outfits that he designed for himself. Pat, Patton wanted to have a custom made tank commander outfit that he designed himself with like pinstripes. Homo social relationships fun. created the theatrical aesthetic that then was legitimized into being an open gay identity. The yeah. thing that he thinks is awful. But that was, yeah, before it was really an option. It's like, yeah, you'd go into the military and you'd go in front of like, all these fucking poor conscripts who can't read in front of you and be like, places, everybody, come on. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like a mean theater guy. And you were, well, you were still tough. But yeah, if you were like, I just like pussy. It's like, yeah, I'm going to put on a wig and become Gilbert and Sullivan. I want to go back to a real man. Uh, I have a good Eric Adams thing to close okay. this out. <laughs> What's the best concert you've ever been to? Curtis Mayfield at Wingate Concert Series. At that concert, there was a rainstorm, and the lights fell on Curtis Mayfield, and they actually paralyzed him at that concert. He died a few years ago, but it was an amazing concert before that happened. Just so unfortunate. <laughs> what? <laughs> the best concert he ever saw was one that was rained out, and where Curtis uh, Curtis Mayfield Curtis was Mayfield put in the got fucking, fucking hospital, paralyzed. Where it was the paralyzed by falling lights. Killed Curtis Mayfield. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if someone. Well, he didn't die, but like, it, that's it, he, he was literally paralyzed for life after that. That's like literally. How is the play other than that, Mrs. Lincoln? But she responds <laughs> my, like, "My favorite live music experience, Great White." <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, it was they, the Rolling the, Stones set at Altamont. Yeah. They they also asked him about uh, Israel because he's going to be New York's mayor and how he's going to advocate for it. And he said, "I visited Israel twice. I'm going back again, and I'm going to try to find a plot of land so it can be my retirement place." I love what? the people of Israel, the <laughs> oh food, my God. the culture, the dance, everything about Israel. Okay. And they ask him, Eric where Adams. in Israel do you plan on retiring? And he says, in the Golan Heights. Oh, oh my, my God. God. <laughs> Holy oh my shit. Fuck. Eric, okay, he's going to be mayor. Yeah, he's, I'm sorry. he's going like, to be mayor. I, don't don't vote so for him, awesome. but he's going to win tomorrow. Don't I'm vote, sorry. Don't vote for him, but like that's it. Like, you know, you know what? He didn't even think that before. He was like, oh, fuck, Israel. I'm going to retire in Golan Heights. Yeah. I love, I love just, like, the, number one, wait, yeah. the number one controversy that has dogged Eric Adams in this mayoral race is the fact that he lives in New Jersey. And then he's just like, yeah, I'm going to move to the Golan Heights. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy property there and move there. Like he's, after I'm, he's going to be a settler. <laughs> like, he's uh, by the way, amazing. I would love to see how... how how warm the warm embrace that Eric Adams and his family will receive among fellow Israeli settlers oh, no, will go on great. heights. They'll love him. It'll be great. They'll be so nice to him. Uh, no, uh, he's. They'll give him so many pe- vegan pizza meals that he can enjoy. Well, he's like, I mean, I don't want him to win, but it's like he's so, he's such a completely like fucked up person that it's like he. Yeah, I kind of think he is going to win. He's the Biden of the race in every respect. I mean, if if if. If po- if our national politics holds to form at a local level, I mean, Eric Adams has got this sewn up. I mean, yeah. I hate to say it. Yeah, my favorite concert was when Curtis Mayfield got paralyzed. Before <laughs> he got paralyzed, of course. Like, what a great interview. I mean, yeah, no, I don't like his policies, but just he has the right personality to be yelled at all the time. The, you they, well, you know he does because they asked him about how he's feeling about uh, being up in the polls, and he said, not happy, not sad. The man with the wax wings flew just enough. Not too close to the sun, not too close to the water. Steady. <laughs> what the fuck Wait, are you what? talking about? No, that's the opposite <laughs> of what happened in that happened story. At all. I think he's imagining, like, he probably heard that story and then just thought, <laughs> if, well, if I had wax okay, wings. Oh, yeah. If, if I was Icarus, I would have just stayed yeah. at exactly the right altitude yeah. so that the wax wouldn't melt. Yep. I kind of think he probably just killed himself for a bit, which is yeah. like, hilar- hilarious. Which, it's the end result That's of amazing. internet, like, meme people. You know, you have, if your life is entirely defined by your, your status as a self-aware meme, then you have to go out like a meme. Yeah. You have well, to he, have, make sure people are saying McAfee didn't kill himself for the next well, he got, he got the That's tattoo. what gets you motivated to go through with it. He got a tattoo specifically, like, to commemorate his non-suicidalness, should he ever be... Um, detained by the u.s government 
Yeah, well, like, that's the thing. I do think if he was Epstein, it wouldn't be like... With Epstein, it's like, okay, that's obvious. Like, international intelligence community, blackmail, all this shit. Like, yeah, no, this is the highest of the high stakes. If McAfee was Epstein, it was over, like, $30,000. Yeah. It was like a Sons of Anarchy type thing. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's, just, why, yeah. that's why he probably set this up for people to think that he killed himself because that makes him a bigger deal than he really was, which is what why he had to be a meme and embrace it so much is, hey, yeah. he got to be a legend without... What was he? He was the asshole who made a fucking antiviral program that is a giant a pain in the ass and everyone wants to remove from their computer. That That's it. That's what he did, and then he just took that money, like any of those assholes who got lucky in the early uh, internet, then went down, uh, killed a guy in Belize... Uh, and then just posted himself uh, into custody and then uh, offed himself. Why would anyone care about him unless his life uh, ends in a way that affirms that he must have known something, that he had power, that his crypto knowledge was going to undermine the U.S. dollar or some bullshit, or that he had all of the Epstein information? Remember there was that whole thing where people thought that he was the guy flying the drone around uh, Little St. James? And he was like, oh, yeah. And then he like talked about how he knew Q. And then they posted Q on his Instagram, like the, the moment that he uh, announced his suicide. It just seems like he's trying to make people think that he mattered. Well, you know, if you, if you get to script, your, uh, script an end, I mean, it could certainly be a fitting one. Or uh, perhaps he was Epstein in his jail cell in Spain to stop the truth of the quantum suicide boxes, which govern reality and allow time travel to take place. It's true. If he... If he is quantum, but if that's the case, then he very well might have eluded them before they got there by doing a quantum suicide before they could do a real suicide. Well, like I said, I think he's in El Salvador right now. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he's with Palma. <laughs> you know, we've made our jokes, we've had our fun, but like, we want to be clear. We totally endorse everything he did and said, and we absolutely. think he was a good person. Yeah, he was a good. He was a hero. That much is clear. He was a good guy. Yeah. That should be obvious to everyone. Yeah. He was uh, simply a legend, and we have to doff our cap to him. Respect in the next yeah. quantum afterlife, sir. He died because he was going to expose the global conspiracy, the truth that uh, like one of his neighbors in Belize like, owed him a cigar box full of like, dusty, moldy dro. And he was killed for it. <laughs> the greatest dead man switch of all time. He did. He did have a dead man switch. Like he did. There was like some I crypto mean, we'll thing. See. But it's 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 gonna be like it's gonna be like Rick Roll. One of the <laughs> <laughs> one of the craziest internet memes of all time. Well, you know, I'm gonna give Dahlia credit here and say that she's not actually just secretly trying to keep the court the way it is. If you, I as I was reading, listening to that. If you, uh, to what she was saying and the argument she was making in that piece, if you strip it of her normative assumptions, if you strip it of all of the connotation and language in the article that indicates that she agrees with Breyer on this, she is making a very compelling argument that is, I think, accurate, which is if you want Breyer to retire in time to be replaced by a Democrat, don't tell him that he has to retire because he is very invested in the idea of the legitimacy that the legitimacy of the court and his uh, distance from the political system, which means if you remind him and remind everybody else that he represents a partisan side, he will, to prove that's not true, refuse to retire. And that's ding, ding, correct. Ding. That ding, is ding, correct. Amazon gift card so she's right. To Matt. So she is correct. This article is all right. The reason that it's infuriating and the reason that it's it serves as propaganda it. is because she agrees with Breyer. No, right. I mean, like, well, I mean, even if she doesn't agree with Breyer, she's willing to couch everything with, through through this like uh, um, a distancing about a, why it's bad to tell him to retire, except for the one reason that might actually be the same one, which is that if you hurt the feelings of this senile mummy, he'll yes. be less likely to do the thing that you want him to do. So she could have wrote an article that said that. But that would be giving the lie to this whole idea that the Supreme Court is like a legitimate institution, yeah. and not like fucking nine senior citizens who are given lifetime appointments, even though they think it's 1985. Because she's not making an argument like uh, observing this, like, hey, stop, stop yelling at the old man. He's, he's going to his horseradish is going to get up. She's over by his side saying, no, no, listen to Stephen's feelings like she's invested in his point of view all through it. And that's like, what makes it risible. He goes. And that alone show on the History Channel, 
alone involves reclusive survivalists with hatchets in the woods trying to outlast the others. Lonely day after lonely day, worried about bears and having to kill or eat or fail and starve. I, I can't, I just, the fact that he's obsessed with this reality show that is basically just a uh, televised version of how he feels every second of the day, not his actual life, but his psychological inner life is, I think, why he is so attracted to the show alone. Because it's like, what is he doing all day? He's lonely and miserable and worried about eating and not being allowed to eat by his, by his life coach. Yeah, there's a Herodin who tells you that it's, you can't have 3 p.m. sausage. They talk to themselves in their crude shelters in the woods. <laughs> that sounds like the, <laughs> the social media function of johncastnews.com. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is like... A message in a bottle just sent out yeah, on this a is, pond. This, this totally not predicts to anyone. johncastnews.com. Sometimes they laugh and weep in the same breath with only a few empty-headed jays to hear their tales of woe. I mean, again, he, he, just, he paints such a picture. It's, it's just a, a, a psychological landscape that he's describing and that, that he inhabits is so absolutely bleak. I just <laughs> Well, this is yeah, he's like a type of artist that like we love, right? Where it's like someone who's a brilliant artist but not like in the thing they were intending to be. Like yeah. he Cass like thinks he's like a sort of like Royko ask like every man who has a cool appraisal of what the world's like and is like a little bit cynical, but he truly wants what's best and he has a very idiosyncratic way of funnily describing the world. But in reality, what this is and like why it's so great is because it's like he's accidentally telling you like how lonely and miserable and scared he is all <laughs> yes, the time. Yes. He's like too shitty of a right. Like if he meant to do that, he wouldn't be able to. But just like by letting himself flow, you're like, oh, I completely see what he what he sees when he closes his eyes. Talking sports is safe. Talking TV is safe. Safe. There was a lot of talking in that U.S. Mexico game played in Denver. The fans of the Mexican national team, El Tri, talked and talked and threw bottles at the American players, and some offered slurs about the goalkeeper's sexuality. But when things were going their way and Mexico was winning, they shouted, ole, ole, as is their want. It was getting tiresome. Later in the game, when the U.S. Could, Shut the fuck up. <laughs> this is so boring. <laughs> this is so boring. He's doing it. He can't do it to people in the Home Depot, so he's just doing it to his readers. I'm fucking yeah. losing my mind. Where's his life coach? <laughs> Shut the fuck up about this U.S.-Mexico game, dude. I don't he's give a shit. The Euro <laughs> Even if you care about soccer, the Euro Cup is going on. That's real fucking football, not this bullshit exhibition match. Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm sorry. I re rarely bump into these things, but this is like the, the brain firing ramblings of a dying man. No. Yeah. That's what he's been doing for like 30 years. And like, this is amazing because it's like you, you have this thing that you like voluntarily pick to read always with Cass, at least with like us. And you're like excited to read it because he's such like, he's so loathsome, but it's like his prose is such that like, you feel like you're being assaulted. <laughs> You feel like you're being cornered with him, like he's sticking a fucking 38 in your gut and telling you this. So, I mean, like, and now we're getting into another major cast obsession, which is not being able to eat things like blue cheese butter. Um, he says, later, perhaps a fine Maduro cigar. Perhaps he'll sneak a slice of banana cream pie. She denies him pie these days, but his intelligence network has informed him that the pie will indeed be offered. She denies him pie these days. Again, another <laughs> another sentence that's like it's like like a diamond bullet fired into my. She forehead. denies him pie these days. She denies him pie these days. I mean, it's just like it's, it's like so, something Horatio Higgins says to Eliza Doolittle. It's to get so her to speak English better. But like it's it's so imbued with with, with uh, layers of meaning and <laughs> consequences. Yeah, it's here. like yeah. It, yeah, it's like if um. Yeah, if like a fucking um, Cormac McCarthy book just took place in a guy's like basement man cave, yes, like they didn't go anywhere, but it still has the same like haunting prose. See the John, he is large. He wants the butter <laughs> yeah. for his pies. She denies him pies these days. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> oh my god! Like, she I is dancing. Is <laughs> she is dancing. She denies him pies these days. Please, so, <laughs> please, me and my son just want to make it to the hot dog cart one day. Sometimes, sometimes the lamb goes to Home Depot. Sometimes they cry. Sometimes the wolf comes. 
he's I know this isn't very likely, like given his habits. Um I hope he lives like another thirty years <laughs> and writes for all of them. Oh come on. Of course he's gonna live another thirty years. He's another Trump guy. Like it's just it's, oh, none, yeah, none of these guys like live there, forever. There is no artery blockage like too great for them to power not power through. But it's just like every article has a new health problem. Like in ones that I like now, you know, a frequent cast reader, ones that I didn't even know he had. It's like it's you can't it's like Dragon Ball Z, you need like a previously on. Because it'll be like, <laughs> like as you guys know, as, as you guys know, I have the condition known as like pate soul. <laughs> He's, he has the Monty Bird syndrome though. All of those yeah. diseases cancel each other out. He'll live forever. That's nah, true. Oh,